Okay, uh, my name is Tom Riley. I uh, was asked to MC this. I used to be the mayor of Oskaloosa. Uh, I used to serve in the state senate representing this district, and I currently uh, serve on the DOT commission. And I think the real reason why I'm here uh, is to uh, also, you know, participate in this dedication for the, the the marker, historical marker. But most important to to really pay tribute to a, a wonderful, generous lady. Uh, Kim Gigi Blackwell. Uh, so first of all, I just want to welcome you all to coming out. Try to stay cool. Try to stay in the shade. Uh, also, I want to thank Oski News for you know, your always continued wonderful coverage. Uh, and uh, Andy McGuire, you're my audio man. Thank you for everything. Uh, as I said, I serve on the DOT Commission. And I don't think, I know people realize we had the seven member governor appointed commission come to Oskaloosa on Monday and Tuesday of this year, of this week. And we took a tour of all of the really kind of South Central Iowa various projects that's going on. And I kept hearing from various commissioners and other people about what's going on in Oskaloosa. How are you guys getting things done? And I think it really kind of reflects to what you all are doing here tonight and this great historical project that's been going on. Take a look at the different buildings that we've paid tribute to and the, the, the different people that have been participating with this. It really shows uh, a lot of pride in our community. And I think it's great. And you also take a look at the various projects that's going on throughout, whether it's the new Y, the Lacey Complex, the bike trail, the new, the new uh, hotel. Buildings, and they prompted us to say, hey, take a look at the library. We'd like to be part of this. So, so and we're glad they did when we look at the significance of the building, as well as the impact that that has had on our community here. And then uh, Julie Hansen will end up and talk about the, the renovation and expansion of the library. So one of the things people may ask is, why do you want to talk about the prehistory of the library? Why, why is that as important? Well, one thing that's very obvious, if you don't have a building site, then you can never have a building. So to, to look at some of the history, some of the events that have a direct impact on the building, uh, on the site, also have a direct impact on the building. So I'm going to talk about two historical things about the, the site of the, the property. And one of them is where you're sitting right now. Um, the, the library is a building, but it's also a campus. You look around here and we have the, uh, uh, the parking lot, we have this space. That was all added later because when the library was built in the early 1900s, there was um, no need for a parking lot. People came to the library on foot, by trolley, or on the bicycle. And if you were, uh, uh, had a little wealth, you had the, the livery come and get you, which was the forerunner of Uber. Uber. So, so now we're, uh, I'm going to have you take a, show a picture, and I want to see if anybody recognizes this, because this was the owner of this place where you're sitting in 1929. Are there any guesses? Uh, a lot of people would remember this as Bernard College. But what this really was in 1929, it was John Fletcher College, and they owned the ground where you're sitting here. So what was uh, the story of John Fletcher College? Well, it started in 1906 in uh, University Park as Central Holiness University. And that was a theological school with a theological emphasis mainly from the uh, Wesleyan Methodists, but there were also some strains of Nazarene, Pentecostal, and um, Assembly of God were in there, there as, as well. And they did a name change in 1924 to John Fletcher College. Now, we would probably call that today a rebranding. That school had been struggling, so they thought they would want to reinvigorate, revitalize it with a new name, and they also did some building projects as well as then too. And uh, the institution had been really struggling with all kinds of variations in, in um, students coming in, in the student body. Just three years after they started, they had, um, uh, I believe it was, uh, I've, I've got it down here, Ooh, I think 345 students. By 1924, they only had 111 students that had dropped by, by uh, uh, two-thirds. So they rebranded it, and that seemed to help. The very next year, in 1925, they had a 72% increase in students. 
But then they peaked out at 1928 and started going down, going down a downhill slide. So then the trustees of the college wanted to try something different. They wanted to try to get, attract investors to the college. And so what they did was they offered annuities that they offered to say, you give us cash, you give us property, we will give you a lifetime annuity for, for that. And so they did a very interesting slogan with that that said, make your investment in institutions that have the backing of God. Now, if you had an investment that had the backing of God, you'd pretty well be guaranteed you'd get it back, right? Well, let's see what really happened here. So if you look at the map on, on there, you'll see the, uh, the part that I have shaded in yellow, which is the south side of the driveway. That was owned by a, a couple that was named Albert and Eliza Roosh. And the Rouches are, we don't know too much about them. They were um, a childless couple, so there's no more descendants of them live, living in this area. But the one thing we know about Albert is that, that he w w owned a saloon here in Oskaloosa. Now, when you think of John Fletcher University and you think of a saloon keeper, they're exact opposite because John Fletcher uh, College did not allow any drinking on campus. So either Albert had a conversion or John Fletcher College needed the cash. One of the two things happened. So, so they met together. And on May 15, 1929, they deeded this property to John Fletcher College. And in return for that deed, they were promised to get 250 bucks a month for the rest of their, their lives. Now, why would they do that? Well, you have to think in 1929, there was no social security net. And once you became retired and you had no children that you often moved in with, they needed some stability in, in life. Now, you think about uh, May of 1929. Does anybody know what happened in October of 1929? That was the stock market crash. That was when Black Friday happened, and that set the stage for the events that, that unfolded in that, that time. The college became more uh, desperate for cash, so this very property that they were deeded, they went and asked a lady in Chicago if they could borrow money from her, and they would give this, this property as collateral, where we're sitting on, on right now. And uh, the Rouches probably made the biggest financial blunder of their lives because they allowed that, that to happen. The college continued to struggle financially. They could not pay the people that they had promised annuities to. And eventually the college folded and was sold on the courthouse steps in the late 1930s. At that time, finally, in 1938, Eliza and Albert filed a lawsuit against the college to get their property back. And in addition to filing against the, law, uh, the college, you'll see this filing here, there are 30 different other people they filed against because that was all the judgments that were against John Fletcher College that attached to the property. And you see some local names in there. You see Oskaloosa Home Loan was one of them. You see Graham Stores. But you see some national names in there as well, too. You see the Milton Bradley Company that probably supplied some recreational equipment. You see the Kudahe Packing Company, which was also a, a company that provided food products, likely, at, at that time. And then there's lots of individuals. One name that stands out, it's F.A. Strawbridge from um, uh, Sigourney. He had given 150000 to the college in an annuity. And in today's number, if you do a, um, a inflation calculator, that'd be $2.9 million on that. It went to trial. The judge voided the deed because they said John Fletcher College did not honor its obligations, and so they gave the property back to the Rouches, but they got stuck paying that mortgage. And again, that was a $10,000 mortgage, but in today's world, that would be 192000 So the Rouches, who thought they would get a lifetime benefit, in turn had to pay that off to, to, to have their property back so that they could sell it. So this side of the driveway here really has a story of broken promises, of, of dreams that were dashed, and uh, um, um, people that had good intentions but could not make it happen. The one thing you think about, though, because the college failed and it was not in their endowment forever, it eventually went back into private hands and became the opportunity for the library to buy it down the road. 
Now, with that uplifting story, we are now going to go across the, the driveway here, and we're going to look at the two lots that were purchased by the city of Oskaloosa that were in, in 1902. They were purchased by an individual called F. A. Schaefer, F. B. Schaefer, I'm sorry, who was a banker in, in Oskaloosa. And this deed was very unusual because it, it, it listed him as trustee, but it never said what he was trustee of. That, that remains a mystery. And it also had something very unusual. It said, this property shall be used for a library. You never see that in deeds. I see a lot of them in my own profession of banking, and it's very rare that you specific, specify the, the use of the property on there. Now, while that deed was unusual, the one that happened right before that was even more unusual. The same F.B. Schaefer as trustee had bought the property only one year earlier and again used the, pro the title of trustee, and he had bought it for the exact same amount that he sold it for. Well, you know there's something fishy going on because bankers, they're kind of a greedy bunch. They never sell it for what they uh, paid for on that. So I think there was some things going on in, in the background with the city council. I know our mayor here would maybe never say there's any backroom deals done, but uh, it seems to me that there was something that, that was strange about that. The other thing strange about that the person that he bought it from, or the persons, were four single people, all with the last name of Evans. And the deed was signed in Arizona, which was not even a state at that point, it was a territory. So that begs the question, who were the Evans? Now there's gonna be a clue on here that maybe somebody can recognize on the next slide. I don't know if you can see it, but at the top it says Evans Building. Does anybody know where that is? True value. So that is known as the Evans Building. And the story of David Evans was that he was a well-known builder in, in Oskaloosa. He came here in the early days, probably in, in around 1847. He built the Town Square Dental Building, which at that time was Frankel State Bank. He built the Herald Building, and he supervised the building of the courthouse. The Evans Building was something that he built for himself. He was a native of Wales, and he married a native of Switzerland. And once again, as I look at the history of Oskaloosa, sometimes you think these prairie towns were very um, similar type people in the town, but there was a huge diversity. And once again, this shows it with somebody from Wales and somebody from Switzerland in, in, in town. David and Marie died within four months of each other in 1897, and their four children who signed the deed received that property. This stone here is in Forest Cemetery, and you'll see there's the unusual name of Lon as his middle name, and he just created that middle name. It's L-L-A-N, and that is the references the name of his hometown in Wales, which is Londolos. His daughter, Dula, who was somewhat of a free spirit, who we're going to talk about later as well, she also took the middle name of Lon. She was not born with that name, and she also named her son Evans Lon. So that name came um, followed for three generations after that. The next slide, you'll, you'll see the census of 1900, right before the, the, the library was purchased. Um, on the side there, it gives the address, which is 301 South Market Street, and you see the four Evans children living there, with the oldest one being 28 and the youngest one being 22. So four siblings, all, all um, single, living in that house. Here is a picture of them in Arizona, and um, I'm guessing this picture may have been taken when they signed the deed. And the next picture shows a little bit of a close-up of, of, of them. And the taller lady on the, the left side is Dula. And that's who we're going to be talking about now. Dula became one of Oskaloosa's most famous people that left in the art world. And if you look at her picture there, you can even see that she had the confidence. She had the persona of maybe of an artist. The way she dressed here in the, in the, the, the clothes that, that showed that she was a little bit outgoing on there. She went to Penn College for one year and then went to the very prestigious um, Chicago Art Institute. 
And while she was there, she, she did uh, many, um, went to different art colonies, with some being in Arizona, some New Mexico, California, and New York, and she developed a, a kind of an Impressionist style. Um, she started, she married a guy by the name of Albert Kreeble, who was also a student at the Art Institute. And while uh, they were there, um, um, they worked together on several projects. She started her own business and became very well known as an illustrator and of paintings that she made for sale. In the next slide, we'll see that in 1907, Albert won the contract to paint all the murals on the Illinois State Supreme Court building. And those murals, if you've ever been like in our own um, uh, uh, state house, are very storytelling. They're very flowing of uh, go back to Latin and Greek. And this task took over seven years to build them. We have a picture here of Dula that was posing for Albert to do one of the murals. And now let's see what that pose turned out to be. There she is. So I don't think if anybody would say, is there an Oskaloosa native painted on the walls of the Illinois State Supreme Court building, we would say no. But here we have Dula in that picture. The mural represents the allegory of justice with precedence and record. So on one torch, she's holding record, which would be the court record when you have a case. And the other torch, she's holding precedence. What precedence do you follow when you try, try a case? We'll see a couple other pictures of Dula. The next one is a illustration that was on the front page of the Chicago Daily Herald in 1915. And I don't know if any of you had babies that took um, uh, baths in the dishpan, but this was probably very common at, at that, that sign. And this happened to be her own son that she pictured that was Evans Lawn. And the last picture I'm gonna show here is the picture that is now housed permanently in the National Museum of Women of the Arts in Washington, D.C. She had such an important record in the art world, they decided to put this picture in there. It shows kind of her impressionist style, and the name of the picture is Three Ladies at an Open Window, which is pretty descriptive what we see. And as I go through this, I think, wouldn't it be cool if we could somehow find an original painting of Dula and have it in our own library here, where she once grew up as a kid. And speaking of that building, I'm now going to turn it over to Diana and to Nancy. Thank you, Calvin. My name is Nancy Brown, and I am a member of the Friends of the Library and a former longtime board member of the Friends of the Library. Um, as you can see, this slide says, the only thing you absolutely have to know is the location of the library. When my family and I moved here in 1985, that was the first thing I looked for was the library. But in 1850, that was not very, it was not easy to find a library in Iowa. There were only four in the state of Iowa. But by the 1860, there were 412. Oskaloosa was settled by educated people. The, on the 1850 census, the literary rate, the illiterate rate of Mahaska County was only 1.5%, and the state was 4%. Oskaloosa was much lower than the surrounding counties. I won't mention any names. In 1853, Oskaloosa was incorporated with a population of 1,000 people. In the 1850s, the Harper Library Association was formed. In 1859 was the first time the Harper Library Association was mentioned because there was a timber from the first house in Oskaloosa that was put into the library. In 1870, the Harper Library donated hundreds of volumes to the Oskaloosa High School Library. In 1881, the Oskaloosa Education Library was mentioned. It was a combination of the Harper Library and the High School Library. In 1887, the YMCA started to accumulate a library for their members. They had seven volu 700 volumes. In April of that year, Virginia Knight Logan 
Miss H. L. Briggs, Isora Carver started a movement to organize the Oskaloosa Women's Club. The primary object was to work for a public library. In 1895, the funding was started for the library. The YMCA board conferred with the club and proposed to join the enterprise by turning over to the cause all the books and equipment belonging to the YMCA and no charge. They were remain where they were and the Y secretary would, was to act as the librarian without any salary until the institution had grown to an extent that separate quarters could be maintained. On July 1st of 1895, the agreement was reached for cooperation. In July 22nd of 1895, the organization was incorporated and the first librarian was W.W. Hearn. He was the Y secretary. The women's club made extensive purchases with money received from sources such as the PEO chapter, the Elks Lodge, the Rathbone Sisters, and others. And the Y Library was open to the public on January 1st, 1896 with a subscription fee of a dollar, an annual. And then on March 7th of 1899, a proposition was put to vote to the city to turn it over, and it passed 534 votes to 202. And in January 1st of 1900, the library was turned over to the city. And now Diana will. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I know it's such a hot evening, and believe me, my speech sounded so much more enthralling when I was in the air conditioning than I'm sure it's going to sound tonight. But I'll try to make it as brief as I can and still give you the information. As some of you may or may not know, this library is actually a Carnegie library, and Andrew Carnegie's portrait hangs in the current entrance just inside the door on the left-hand side if you haven't noticed it before. I'll give you a little bit of historical information because it is a Carnegie Library to just give you some background about that. So in 1892, Fairfield, Iowa received a grant from Andrew Carnegie for $30,000, which was later turned into $40,000. And it was significant that this Carnegie gift took a place, and that was threefold. Because Carnegie first... I'm sorry, let's go here. Okay, Carnegie, it was Carnegie's first grant to a community he had presumably never visited. It was his first gift for a library west of the Allegheny City, which is now Pittsburgh, and it was a gift that essentially launched Carnegie's unnamed and unadvertised library program. Between 1892 and 1919, Andrew Carnegie and the Carnegie Corporation provided grants for approximately 1,689 libraries across the United States at the cost of $41,133,850. I don't know what that would be converted to today. According to Carnegie's requirements, which we've talked a little bit about, each community was required to demonstrate support by the city council to provide a site for the building and to it was to tax itself yearly at the 10th of the grant. Every state in the nation, except for Delaware, Rhode Island, and Alaska, got one of these grants from Carnegie and the corporation. The state of Iowa was perfectly positioned to take full advantage of Carnegie's generosity. In 1897, the state had granted partial suffrage to women, and they were given the right to vote in yes or no elections and so establishment of the public library was one of those elections and we all voted yes so then for the communities across iowa carnegie's gift to fremont provided a powerful incentive to acquire similar cultural landmark landmarks led by other women's organizations and that happened here in oskaloosa as nancy indicated so uh, between 1892 and 1919, there were 104 communities that applied here in Iowa for Carnegie's money. And ultimately, only 99 communities accepted the money. And of those communities, they built 101 public libraries. Waterloo built two libraries, and Sioux City bought one, built one library and also a branch. 
Carnegie also provided seven academic libraries to the state. The active response of Iowa's communities meant that Iowa received the fourth largest number of grants nationwide and built the sixth highest number of public libraries and the third highest number of academic libraries during the period of Carnegie's program. Interestingly, the distribution of public libraries across the state was not systematic nor was it comprehensive. In as late as June of the 1920s, and remember the crash in 29, there would still be 10 county seats without a public library. These are free public libraries, and five counties were without a library altogether. The uneven distribution of Carnegie libraries across the state demonstrates that Iowa communities took the initiative to pursue the Carnegie funds individually. So that was very important because some communities did not reach the three goals that were important for uh, Carnegie in order to give his funds. In almost every situation, an architect from outside the community, and again, Oskaloosa was an exception to that, was hired to design the buildings that were intended to be modern and stylish as any other building built across the country. The libraries were proclaimed to be symbols of the community pride and achievement. This rich cultural heritage continues a century later as so many of the Iowa commi committees and communities have found ways to celebrate this historical movement through the preservation of Carnegie buildings. Oskaloosa Public Library is no exception of the community pride and commitment to the public libraries and Carnegie's library in particular. Now going back to what Nancy's timeline for the Oskaloosa Public Library of 1902, Oskaloosa was notified of the donation of $20,000 from the Carnegie Corporation. They had the land which was one of the requirements and it was purchased for $2,500. Plans were submitted by an Oskaloosa native by the name of Frank Witherall, and it was his first major commission, but he went on to build and uh, be an architect for other libraries in Iowa. The architectural style is neoclassic or classical revival, designed as a two-story structure with a raised basement. It's made of pressed brick and has gray terracotta trim. The old main entrance is surrounded by a classical portico, and this building was built by John Geyer. It was opened in September 8th of 1903 with 5,000 volumes, and I would have no idea how many volumes we have currently in our library. Do you have any idea, Marion? Over 85,000. Over 85,000. So in 1905, an additional grant was given by Carnegie for $2,500 to finish the second story. I mentioned that there were 101 Carnegie libraries that were built in, the, in Iowa, and of those built, 48 public Carnegie Library buildings are still used as libraries, Oskaloosa's being one of them. We're very proud of that. 45 public Carnegie Library buildings still exist but are no longer used as libraries, and eight of the Carnegie Library buildings are no longer in existence. Of the seven academic libraries that were built using Carnegie funds, only one is still used as an academic library, Four are still in existence, but not library, and unfortunately, two of those libraries have been torn down. So I do have a list of all the Carnegie libraries, both public and academic. If anyone wants to look through it, it's listed by the, st by the name of the town. It tells you the date of the grant, the amount of the grant, and a little brief encounter about if that library is still in existence. So if somebody has a hometown or some connection with another city, you're welcome to come up here when they're giving the tours and while you're waiting for your turn to look through that. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll turn it back over to Nancy. As you can see, these are some of the uh, pictures of the building, the way it originally looked. This was the invitation uh, for the dedication and it was September 7th, 1903 and it was opened um, on the 8th for the public. The next slide is Elizabeth Mich Mishner. I'm sorry. She was one of the first head librarians and she worked here at the library for seven decades. That is a dedicated woman. <laughs> the next slide, this is Mary Frush behind the counter with, and this would be like in the early 1860s, 1960s, 
And the boys are from left to right is Randy Kentfield, Bobby Grunendike, Greg Gordy, and Randy Davis. And there's one more slide. Okay, these ladies are, this would have been probably in the 60s or 70s, the way they look. It's Winifred Par Parcell and Martha Moore. And I wish I knew Alice, because I'd say, you got it, sister. That is still relevant today. And our libraries served the community for decades. But in the latter half of the century, problems started to be exposed. When I came here in 1985 to Oskaloosa, the first thing I did was come to the library and try to get a job. And they were so lovely and gracious and let me work Friday nights at the desk, which actually is a wonderful time because of the, all the oddballs are at the library on a Friday night. And I fit right in. I thought I found my people. So that was a great thing. The board at that time was discussing, what do we do? We can't house the collections. The library is antiquated in terms of electricity. And actually there was kind of a funky odor. I'm, I'm sure you remember that, Linda. It didn't smell good. We needed to do something. And at that time, they really thought they would build a brand new library. They even went so far as to purchase a lot over by the old junior high. A decade later, I'm on the board and we're still trying to decide what to do. And the president at that time, Pat Weingartner, she had been driving to her son's baseball game and noticed a Carnegie library that had been renovated and expanded and brought that idea back to the board and the board decided this is it, let's do it, let's stay and let's save our beautiful building. We had another incentive. The library got um, by a local citizen, Bob Kerr, and, and rest in peace. And I debated whether I should state his name, but he actually turns out to be the hero of this story. He filed a civil rights complaint against the library for not being ADA compliant. And we were not, we were so out of compliance, let me tell you. And he had successfully sued the city earlier because city hall was not ADA compliant. And I talked to the city attorney who was serving at that time, and he requested anonymity. I will only say, he is the love of my life. <laughs> and I'm gonna respect his privacy. And when I asked him about the lawsuit over breakfast, he was pretty grumbly. He would only say, you cannot defend the indefensible. So I, I'm not gonna hold him responsible for that. So, we come up with a solution to renovate and expand. We faced a huge funding problem. We wanted, we thought about a bond issue. Bond issues take 60% of the vote to pass and that it proved increasingly difficult in Oskaloosa. The school had really struggled for several years and they had finally passed one. We also thought about just trying to fundraise, but in the community at that time, there were several important projects. The auditorium, actually was the sweetheart in town and got a lot of the ready. But I'm so glad. I'm so glad you exist. The wooden <laughs> playground, Spencer Chapel at William Penn, which is a really important project, was seeking funding too. So that wasn't going to work. I had been at a library conference and heard about libraries issuing a local option sales tax to fund their building projects. And a local option sales tax only had to pass by 50%. And we thought that is the way to go. We quickly formed the Sense for the Sales Tax Committee. Pat Weidengardner and Carolyn Nunning-Coven and Dave Dixon did so much work to get it passed. Dave and Pat would go all over town speaking to anyone who would allow them. We had phone banks. Carolyn would set up interviews. And at the time she goes, please don't mention my name. Please don't mention my name. So I've waited 24 years to give her the credit she deserves. It passed by 72% in the city of Oskaloosa, so we were really chuffed up about that. One of the major players that was, uh, that was responsible for the success really was the Chamber of Commerce, led by John Sullivan, because the Chamber said, this is a really good idea, and they got behind us. And I really attribute them uh, a lot of credit in what transpired. I did find out Bob Kerr did vote no on it. <laughs> And, but I kind of understand that. A sales tax is a regressive tax. He felt a bond issue should have been passed. So, but we got the new, we got the funding. 
Now, we start. We start the project with no director, and it wasn't a really good thing. Luckily, Linda Fox came to our rescue and served as our interim director. And while I was researching this, I did find out how much we paid her. It was peanuts, and I really feel bad about that. I'm sorry. She did a tremendous job. We hired Nancy later that year, Nancy Simpson. She shared our passion and vision for what the library could be. And I can easily say, without Linda, this project wouldn't have gotten started. And without Nancy, this project wouldn't have been completed. And the project begins. Now, the idea initially was for the sales tax to accrue before we could be begin. But luckily, Mayor Norm Zimmerman and our current mayor, I thought he was here. There he is, Dave Kretzfeld. He was serving on the city council. And he said, let's issue bonds early. Let's get going. And you're quoted in the, he's quoted in the paper as being a real enthusiastic supporter of the library. And we really appreciated that. Nancy involved the staff in the community in the project. She would always be taking people on tours of building sites, and Linda, you even gave tours to young people so that the community, community could really feel a part of this project. Uh, Nancy would also take a level with her and set it in all the windowsills and all the surfaces because she wanted everything straight and true. Bernice Hahn, Bernice was the chair of the building committee. Bernice um, is incredibly focused and hardworking and completely unflappable. And I can't tell you how good that was during this project and a year of mess. The staff, this picture is the staff touring the site. They really worked hard too, because you're working hard in really cramped corners and it was a difficult year for them, but they still provided the library services that the community needed. We moved to a temporary location and so many folks, and I know I see some of you in the audience, Norm Zimmerman, and Diane Van Gorp, and Bob Lynn, and Nick Williams, so many people came out and helped us move. My own library at William Penn, I always mention them whenever I have a microphone. They donated the shelving, and guess who else helped out? It'd be Tim Blackwell, who donated labor, and uh, donated trucks to help move our furniture. And I can't tell you how much all this helped. And this is Linda. She's probably thinking, where did everything go? <laughs> Moscow donated a parking lot that allowed for the new orientation of the building that was critical to the success of the project because we needed to come in uh, at this elevation for it to work out. And the project came in under budget. The community, of course, helps us move the library books back. And can anyone raise their hand if they were involved in this project? <laughs> yeah. We were so grateful to so many people for the help. And I thought, this, this is an image of the, of the rededication in 1997. And I thought at the time, wow, this has been quite an experience and uh, a lot of stress because you're spending public tax dollars. And as Carolyn would tell us all, we can't fetter away the money. We have to be careful. And we did want to do a good quality job and restore that beautiful building to, to its uh, original structure. So we really worked on that, and it was really stressful. In the fall of 2019, Marion comes up to me and says, why don't you get back on the library board? I think it was at a Art on the Square. And I said, sure, that'll be a piece of cake. And then March 2020 comes along. And I can easily say, serving on the board during the pandemic was much, much worse. You really worried about the health and safety of the staff. You worried about denying access to critical services to the most people in need and the dispossessed in Oskaloosa. We made some really hard decisions. And it, and it has been bad. And you would think that maybe all the library did was just tread water or move backwards, but we actually were able to move forward. And we were able to move forward because of Marion and the staff, and because of the generosity, born of grief, of the Blackwell family.
Thanks, Julie. I was wondering if we just get another round of applause. That was a tremendous, great job, guys. Very, very interesting. Um, actually, as that was all going, it got me thinking. My mom was a librarian at Jefferson uh, Elementary School, and my dad was pretty much a staple here. Uh, he was a Depression era kid, and he, I said, "Won't you?" Um, he would never buy books. He says, "Why do you need to buy books when you got a library card?" He always has a library card. So, uh, again, great job. Uh, uh, now we move on to uh, the dedication for the Kim Blackwell uh, Makerspace uh, project uh, place, and I'm really honored to them. Uh, Ann Brower asked that I come and do this. And I'm deeply honored to be able to do that for my one of my dearest friends, Kim Blackwell. And I guess first of all, I just want to introduce the Blackwell family, Austin and Banks. And uh, I did see Bond. I don't see Bond, which makes me a little nervous. Uh, and, and also Brooke. And then uh, uh, Harlow and um, Samantha Blackwell. Samantha's a daughter, and, and her daughter is Harlow. They're in Omaha. They could not make it tonight. And of course, my dear friend. Tim Blackwell. Um, the Blackwells moved back here in 1993, or they moved here in 1993. And ever since, they have been a constant presence when it comes to volunteering and giving. And I'm not sure this town, where this town would be without such a generous family. And, um, you know, the, when I first met Tim, it was at the Wooden Playground Project. Uh, again, uh, you know, it was said, ICI and the Blackwells were here moving the books when it needed to be happening. So, you know, thank you so much from the city of Oskaloosa for the generosity. <laughs> and to the most important person right now tonight uh, is Kim Blackwell. And the one thing that Kim Blackwell I know loved was a short speech and to the point. So I will absolutely do that. Um, a little bit about Kim. You know, she was a voracious reader. She loved books, and she liked to buy books. But so they were very supportive of the, the the library. But I would always see Tim and Kim reading their books, and Kim loved loved kids, and and uh, you know. So I think there was, you know, when they came to what what can we would like to you know do something you know in the memory of Kim Blackwell, the Makerspace project was probably the most fitting project. So. I don't want to go on and on other than I can see, I'm looking out over the, the audience today and I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. Over the last couple of days, we were in Omaha and we, we, we really remembered Kim. There were a lot of moist eyes. Uh, there was you know a lot of great stories being told, a lot of laughs, and we just had a great time remembering her. And I hope we do that again tonight. There's refreshments over there uh, while you wait your turn. And you know, the maker space is for kids of all ages to be creative. And I think that's what Kim would have liked to have, uh, had, would like to have had happen. So, Miriam, uh, do you have anything to say? Let's do it okay, let's do this work. Thank you all for coming out again. And again, uh, to the Blackwell family, Kim, or Tim, Austin, um, Samantha, and specifically Kim, thank you all very much from a grateful Oscaloosa. Thank you.